Thank you for the introduction, and thanks to whoever initiated this uh, conference uh, and supported it. Um, it's me, 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 me. Okay, so um, our field, uh, my field is uh, neuroengineering, and uh, we've been working on several related uh, projects, and I'll try to uh, present to you roughly three stories associated with uh, our activity in this field in, in, in recent years. Um, let me begin. Hmm? Okay, so let, let me show you um, uh, sort of a three three examples. Um, that would give you some uh, insight into what, what is uh, uh, neuroengineering and specifically the field of uh, um, implantable devices and devices designed for interfacing with humans. So the field basically targets either recording or stimulation of electrical activity. Um, so in this particular case, and um, I'll say a few words about uh, these uh, two applications uh, during the talk. So this is an artificial retina uh, and uh, this is a, um, a device that we've been uh, developing designed to restore uh, vision loss. Oh, okay. Uh, these are devices that we build with carbon nanotube, flexible devices, PDMS carbon nanotube, uh, devices that are designed to interface with uh, the human uh, brain uh, either as implantable, uh, either as penetrating electrode uh, or superficial cortical electrodes. And in recent years, we also started working on skin electrophysiology, uh, working on uh, both facial electromyography and uh, EEG. So the common denominator in all these things is that when people started quite long ago, um, actually the first few studies uh, on penetrating electrodes using silicon were in the late 60s. So, you know, this is 50 years now, uh, at least, that people have been talking on using microfabrication uh, and uh, microelectronics to interface with the brain. Uh, the most common and obvious choice was silicon and silicon-related uh, technologies. And up until now, 50 years on, uh, this, has, this is still uh, the technology of choice uh, when it comes both to uh, many academic studies but almost 100% when it comes to industrial innovation in this field. So um, on the other hand, it's very clear that uh, nothing in our brain uh, or the retina or the skin is flat uh, or likes rigid uh, devices. So actually moving into soft devices, but very soft. So if you think about, say, polyamide, polyamide is not uh, soft. Um, Maybe flexible, but doesn't really conform with, with the skin. Uh, again, polyamide would not conform with the cortex. Uh, polyamide would not be tolerated by uh, a very, very thin and gentle uh, retina. So moving into really, really thin, uh, really, really soft, uh, very conformal uh, devices that still have the electrical properties of silicon. So photosensitivity with high efficiency, high quantum yield, uh, excellent electrochemical properties as the best titanium nitride electrodes that people have developed, uh, or uh, surface electrodes that would uh, equal in properties as conventional electrodes. This is still a challenge that we think we resolve them all. Um, so um, let, let me show you some examples. So the retina. So the, the, the retina is the uh, thin layer at the back of our eye. It was introduced yesterday uh, in one of the posters. It constitutes of, of fundamentally three layers, one of which is neural network uh, that remains uh, in, may remain intact in, even in situations where uh, the inner layers uh, degenerate uh, so yesterday, um, um, 
the example was AMD, age-related macular degeneration. It may be a result of other conditions. And the outcome is that the photosensitivity of the retina may be uh, damaged, which means that a person cannot see, but they still have the uh, electrical capacity to see, which means that if you electrically stimulate these neurons, basically you can restore uh, vision. So you can take a wire, put it into the eye, Try, or two wires, right? Uh, you deliver electrical pulse, and a person would see something that is equivalent to a flash of light that comes from a, um, um, basically a flash of light. Okay. Now, putting a wire into the eye uh, is not a practical technology, so you need something a little bit more sophisticated than that. And again, for for several decades now, people have developing uh, technologies. But the truth is that even today, after many decades of work and uh, a lot of academic studies and uh, several um, companies, the best resolution is still very, very miserable. So there are devices with 60 electrodes, okay, something of that order. Uh, this is not what you need for uh, electrical stimulation. So let me show you. Um, so w what are the challenges? So the cha one challenge is the coupling of the electrodes with the biological tissue. The other one is the actual electrodes themselves that have to be very, very efficient. So efficiency in this world means roughness. I'm roughly translated it to very, very simple terms. And one of the best um, uh, things that you can actually achieve with nanomaterials, and uh, in this particular case, the, these are carbon nanotubes, is that you can obtain exceedingly high uh, surface roughness. So if you would compare um, the effective area that you have originally from a flat surface versus the surface that you would obtain uh, by uh, growing carbon nanotubes uh, on the surface could mean uh, something of the order of three orders of, something like three orders of magnitude. And in principle, it also depends on the thickness. So if you make these things very, very thick, you can actually make the surface area uh, effectively larger and larger. Uh, so making such electrode can uh, really improve. This is here a demonstration of the recording, but we did a lot, a lot of uh, investigations regarding stimulation, and you can prove to yourself and to others that you can make uh, using nanomaterials, in particular carbon nanotubes, and this is something we started long, long ago, uh, you can actually improve dramatically the recording capability and reduce the uh, power that is needed for stimulation. So this is a very, very good thing. As I mentioned at the beginning, you also need to do that when the system is flexible. So it's not enough to grow it on silicon. So we had to devise a way how we grow the carbon nanotube at high temperature, but still somehow manage to put all this system on a very, very uh, soft substrate. And this is something we did uh, on uh, uh, PDMS and um, demonstrated that we can make, um, electri again, electrical recording and, ele and efficient electrical stimulation. Trouble being that for this approach to work, you still need many wires to come out. And so if you talk about 100 or definitely 1,000 uh, pixels for restoring vision or for interfacing with a neural uh, system, um, the amount of um, you know, surface area that you have to dedicate just for the wiring is really, really large and basically impractical. So you need to come up with a different approach, and that approach means uh, using optical means, especially if you work in the retina, because the retina is, right, I mean, this is our access to the uh, external world, and so the most natural choice is to use light. So carbon nanotubes basically do not, uh, as uh, pristine carbon nanotubes do not do the trick, but teaming up with uh, the group of Uli Banin and Shlomo um, from the Hebrew University, uh, we were able to take something that looks uh, originally like this, uh, code it um, conformally with uh, plasma polymerization, and then um, achieve nice uh, mechanical, chemical, and electrical binding of quantum rods. So now we have a system that in semiconducting terms have um, a, a, a a band gap that captures the, um, a system with a band gap that can capture the light and then um, 
electron acceptor that can generate the charge separation by which we can achieve uh, the electric, electrical field that we need uh, in order to achieve the stimulation. This was at least the, the idea. So it was actually a pretty uh, um, elaborate process because uh, unlike semiconductors in a dry environment that we can characterize and understand their behavior uh, in, in a pretty straightforward way, um, here we, we actually have a very complicated system. We have the quantum, uh, the carbon nanotubes, we have the quantum rods, and then we have a solution, okay? And then all of our understanding that is derived from fundamental semiconductor physics is not really uh, entirely transferable. Uh, so, you know, we, we had to rely a little bit on gut feeling and a lot of hard work. And just as we discussed uh, earlier this morning, uh, Isra you know, making Israeli students go through uh, many, many, many methodic uh, uh, tests of, of different materials, actually for ourselves as well, was not... Uh, a very pleasing uh, experience, but they actually did it and they had to change uh, the, the different uh, materials, the different coatings, the different uh, various, you see, the various shapes of the, um, uh, of, of the coatings, uh, eventually achieving both high conjugation rate and high efficiency of this um, uh, process that we could characterize electrically. So we had electrical setup that we could systematically characterize many, 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 many different systems. Eventually, going back to the biological system, so here is an isolated retina uh, from um, a chicken, uh, a chicken embryo, actually. So it's day 14 of the development, so the retina is blind. Uh, it's blind not uh, because of uh, genetic reason, but because it has not developed into a stage where it has functional uh, activity of the um, uh, photo uh, receptors. So effectively, this is a blind retina, and we can easily validate that. We can shine strong light, and we can see that it has no um, response other than the blue light response uh, of some of the ganglion cells. But once we do these the same experiments, when the retina is deposited on carbon nanotubes that were uh, um, conjugated with the quantum rods that we optimize, then we can actually see uh, electrical response. So these are the light pulses. This um, is um, um, results of a response that comes about in normal conditions. This is when we um, change the calcium concentration in the solution just to make sure that this is not uh, an artifact and then uh, restore the, respo the original response. So. Um, there, there were, I mean, th this was a really nice uh, result, but it suffered from several shortcomings. One, a as I uh, mentioned, was the pretty complex and sensitive process uh, of making these um, uh, photosystems. Uh, the other one uh, being the fact that uh, the response here is not exactly the one that we expect. It's a little bit difficult to, to uh, explain why. Uh, it has to do with possible uh, additional mechanism in, in addition to the electrical res response, which is heating, which is the last thing that you want in a, in, in a system such as this one. And so at about, as a result, but the result was that since we published the paper, we were approached by another group that um, uh, was in Linz, um, actually the, the group of Serdal uh, Salatsivci, and they were working on these things. Uh, these are uh, materials, pigments, uh, commercial pigments that uh, they've been studying for uh, organic electronics and, and optimizing them for organic electronic applications, realizing that they have several really interesting properties that might be absolutely ideal for electrical interfacing um, in biological systems. So we quickly teamed up with them. Um, we had several exchange visits, uh, started getting samples from them, and started uh, characterizing, again, going through the same process that I described before, where we had the test samples and we could uh, shine strong uh, light pulses, see the response. Uh, here we actually went through a much more methodic process because we, we had a much more robust system. So we didn't have this lengthy process of those um, bare uh, carbon nanotubes that we have to coat. 
but actually uh, could use uh, thin film deposition processes and control different parameters, different dimensions, and systematically uh, and very quick, relatively quickly improve the system. Uh, so you see we could use uh, multi-electrode array uh, with, um, uh, with the uh, photosensitive systems and we could control uh, the different dimensions and, and, and really systematically uh, open them. I'm not going into too many details because I'm just guessing that many of you are not too familiar with the details, but of, of course I will be very happy to answer specific questions. Um, so how do you know again that the system is, is functional? So you, one demonstration was to culture uh, neurons on a large film that had the photosensitive uh, material and you can see that when you flash light and uh, here it's um, right here um, you can see it here this is the point where the light is shining uh, you see the, the strong electrical response of course there's also uh, spontaneous activity that typifies these, uh, these cultures uh, so this is with dissociated cells and we repeated the same thing with the retina and here we actually got exactly what we expected. And what, what do you expect? You expect to see a uh, short latency response which comes about from stimulating the uh, axons and then long latency response that comes about from stimulating the deep, deeper layers of the retina. So this is a textbook uh, image of how uh, retin electrical stimulation of the retina should look like. And this, this is something that was never really demonstrated with uh, photosensitive materials. And the reason being is because probably all other photosensitive materials that were used, including the quantum rods, but P3HD and other materials, uh, also have a, a heating component in the process of the activation, which makes the activation a little bit um, different than what you actually want, which is strictly... Um, um, electrical uh, in nature. So, um, so, so, so we reach this point that we have these uh, fantastic um, uh, PN junctions um, that are implemented on thin layers of gold that is, can be deposited on very, very thin layers of silk. So this is exactly you know, the ideal implant. It's, it's perfectly uh, flexible, very uh, stable, um, has very, very high efficiency. We can, being uh, PN junctions that are deposited thermally, you could actually make multi layers and actually even further increase the efficiency of these things. Uh, so it's a few years now that we've been collaborating with um, Adiel Barak, he's a retina surgeon, and he comes uh, here in this particular case. He's um, making an operation, a vitrectomy operation. If any of you ever came across. Uh, th this is really a, a, a surgical procedure, a standard surgical procedure that is performed on humans where you suck out the vitreous uh, and then introduces these things. This is something that we've been doing for a long, long, long time. We're, we're continuing doing it because now the challenge is to make this whole thing to work and it's really, really, really uh, a complex uh, process. Um, that actually, the, 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 that situation where we keep on working on something, but uh, we know that it's still a very, very long way ahead. Uh, Nathan mentioned 25 years, uh, so you know, 25 years is a good uh, kind of a number. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be 30 years or 50 years, uh, but this is long, long time. And, and I was a little bit eager to see some of our work actually being uh, used in a, a little bit shorter. Uh, period of time and so we started thinking harder and harder I mean what can we do with all these really really nice things uh, that we developed so one idea was to take these things and apply them to the skin right if we use uh, the carbon nanotubes those flexible carbon nanotube electrodes on the skin we actually can resolve something really really fundamental so what is the fundamental challenge is it's it's this problem so uh, this is a picture from May 2018. This is a guy I work with in uh, one of the startup companies I uh, work with in Nano Retina. It's an Israeli startup company. Um, this is 10 p.m. Uh, the kid is uh, just finally hooked up uh, to the system. This is the state of the art, you know, 2018, and this is the state of the art. Uh, this is ridiculous, right? I mean, you know, what, what are all these 
uh, electrodes and all these wires and, and you need a, a technician to, to, put, to put it all in place. And um, th this is for monitoring sleep. So the, this, this really, really excited kid now has to go to sleep. The, the father is completely exhausted, but the kid is, is all, uh, you know, very, very energetic. Uh, and the point is, what may not be obvious is that these are wet electrodes. These are electrodes that are coated with gel. So it's very, very likely that within the seven hours of sleep, uh, they either fall or dry out. So the technician comes in and put them again. You know, it's completely off. So the idea was that uh, since carbon nanotubes are those spiky uh, things, very, very high surface area, placing them on the skin would act as a sort of a, a Velcro. So we were really, really excited about this project and we got to work with it uh, in, in a large uh, consortium with several companies. Uh, and at some point, uh, pretty early on, uh, they started telling us, uh, you know, this is a really great idea, but just don't use nanomaterials. So uh, this was a little bit problematic, uh, but they became more and more uh, aggressive in this demand. Uh, and so we actually... Um, stopped working with nanomaterials. So we looked into um, um, using uh, conventional inks, uh, completely off-the-shelf inks, and um, started implementing them. But instead of using uh, PDMS, we started using uh, other films that are, again, available uh, in large uh, film formation uh, that can very easily and neatly conform with the skin. And the point was that even without using this idea of, of these penetrating carbon nanotubes, just the fact that we started implementing the electrodes on a very, very thin film uh, and, and soft film, so not polyamide, but in this particular case, polyurethane, so a dramatic reduction in the rigidity of the film implied that now the electrodes are positioned right against the skin. So you don't need the gel anymore, okay? So instead of using these kind of electrodes or these kind of electrodes, these electrodes, these horrible things, now we can just print them in arrays here. It's eight electrode arrays or 16 electrode arrays that we uh, make and I'll, I'll show you. Um, and they work just as well. Actually, they work better. Uh, plus, they have many advantages. So now I'm introducing Noah, that everybody here is know. She's our Dugmanita uh, uh, Bait. Um, uh, she's also she also shows in one of our papers. Uh, we developed a wireless system that connects into this, and we can actually do uh, whichever electrophysiology that we want. So we can do either EG, EOG, EMG. We can do them all together. Um, and point being is this, this is the entire system, okay? So you don't need wires anymore. You don't need gels anymore. The whole thing is placed uh, like a plaster. I mean, th th these are two years worth of work, uh, but um, okay, quick and uh, very stable placement that can hold on for uh, many, many, many hours. And that's it. So the, the range of application is actually huge. Um, this, I mean, getting to this point felt for us like, okay, we, we you know, this is, uh, this is, uh, we're done, but, but you're not because now you actually have to verify uh, the properties for many, many different applications. So these are four examples in the field of neuroengineering, which is, again, uh, our field of interest, but we're actually collaborating with quite a lot of people on other fields. So we're using these electrodes for sleep testing, so they're four EEG, two EEG. EOG to EMG, and this is a um, uh, hypnogram, this is sleep staging done at home, I mean recorded at home, and then done by a, a technician. Uh, this is for um, studying uh, emotional uh, responses. Uh, this is the work that we do with uh, Talma Handler on um, using these electrodes for EEG for uh, neurofeedback, uh, and this is high resolution for identifying uh, muscle activation. So this is how it looks like. Uh, this is in a coffee shop. Uh, of course, you know, this is really uh, straightforward if you have uh, uh, Bluetooth here. So this one 
uh, is recording just with a, uh, a wireless phone. Typically, we use LabVIEW, so it's easier to, to run the experiments, but this is, of course, a nice demonstration. So going back to NOAA, um, what we, a lot of our time was actually dedicated in the last two years on not just the recording, which uh, is, is very problematic in surface EMG because it contains a lot of crosstalk, but actually on a lot of signal processing in order to derive... Um, completely took me off... Uh, Okay, so you're, 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 um, the, the point being is that you can, you can really go from surface, uh, surface recordings to single cell uh, recordings and uh, identify uh, not just whether you know, she's smiling, but in which particular muscle she's actually activating. And this is a really, really big uh, field, which again, I, I, I do not have the time to talk about. So let me finish with two demonstrations that would give you the flavor of why recording uh, emotional response is both uh, important but also a lot of fun. So this is how a typical experiment would look like. This is one of the first things we did. Uh, so this is uh, me watching this movie uh, and these are recordings from two specific channels. This is without any uh, signal processing. So this is Mao. He's a Japanese cat, a very extremely popular one. Okay, there are thousands, I don't know thousands, but many, many, many movies of this uh, specific cat, of many, many other cats. Um, and it goes on and on and on. Okay. And, um, okay. So what you do, you record, uh, as I mentioned, you record the, uh, the signal, and then you can make a comparison between uh, different responses. So facial responses uh, vary a lot between people uh, depending on uh, medical conditions. So there are some medical conditions, for example, Parkinson disease, that are associated with facial masking. Facial masking is combination of both cognitive and motor decline that is manifested in, in the expression of um, uh, emotion in the face. So this is one out of many, many, many uh, examples where monitoring facial ex expression in a quantitative uh, manner is, is a very uh, useful thing. So this is, you know, one person, but this is um, um, not enough. So we're actually doing it uh, in, with many, many people. So uh, Lila, who's running these experiments, she connects people uh, to the system. They're sitting this, in this movie now. Uh, and you, you don't see the movie now, okay? You just see the responses, and you would smile again, some of you at least, uh, because you're doing mimicry. You're seeing other people smiling, especially this guy, and you smile in response. So this is also normal behavior, uh, and you, know, you can use that in order to ident identify abnormal behavior. Now, um, as I mentioned, the trick here uh, is not just to, uh, to do the recording, but also um, to go down to the single uh, muscle resolution. And this is done here in this particular case already with 16 electrodes. Um, I'm not really explaining what we're doing, but this is already uh, semi-automated and provides uh, identification of specific muscles. So this is one person, but it's reproduced automatically uh, with pretty much any subject that we use. And here we already identify, this, this is the messenger, uh, these two are associated with, with frowning. So you can go down to single muscle activation, even though you're recording uh, surface uh, electromyography. So um, I, my time is, is, is off, and so I started talking about the retina and what led us eventually, uh, it's really that project that led us eventually to work on the soft EMG EEG electrodes. Um, we didn't, uh, even though it all started from this, we still didn't uh, do it. Sometimes, you know, nano, 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 but uh, people in the industry don't always appreciate nano very much. Uh, so the, the point is that this still has a lot of value 
but may take 25 years to, um, uh, to fulfill. So um, the, the people that actually did the work here, so Lilach Bareket is here. She, she was a PhD now in Australia, actually. Uh, she worked on uh, the, the quantum rod, qu quantum carbon nanotube project along with Gu and uh, David. Um, Lilach PhD work is on the uh, surface facial EMG electrode. Uh, Moshe is my lab engineer and he's been um, um, instrumental pretty much in everything uh, we do. Dorit uh, was also uh, extremely uh, important in, in developing the, the retina. She's an electrophysiologist specializing in, in, in retina physiology. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, um, Selda and, and Eric, who were absolutely uh, delighted to work with. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Yael. I'm sure that Svi has a question. No? Okay. Uh, Dai? Can I tape this sensor in the faces of students during an exam and remote sense if they are cheating? No, seriously, the, the question is, so people of different cultures or different parts of the world may have different facial expressions for the same emotion. Right. So do you, need, do you need like a different atlas for each part of the world? Okay, so... It all started with Darwin, okay? So Darwin had a book uh, named The Expression of Emotion in Man and Animal. And part of his argument about evolution uh, was that uh, facial expressions are, not just facial expression, but other body uh, expressions are universal. Um, and uh, this work was then followed up uh, in the 60s uh, by a guy named Paul Ekman, who developed an atlas, uh, arguing that there are fundamental emotional, facial emotional expressions. This literature is still on, I mean, there's still an ongoing uh, debate whether there are six, seven, 30. Uh, um, it's, it's completely an open question how much of it is universal and how much of it is culturally uh, dependent. Um, the, the whole concept of emotion, once you start looking into it, you understand that it's very, very poorly defined uh, because the gold standard is asking the person uh, about their feeling. Uh, at a very, very, very fundamental level, uh, still the, the, the understanding is that there are fundamental universal uh, emotion of, with, with the same facial expressions. Ekman actually went to, the, to Papua New Guinea uh, in the 60s and uh, showed you know, natives with uh, pictures of uh, expressions and asked them to, so this is how it was all built. So this is still an ongoing thing, but really ridiculously complicated to handle. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Terrific talk. And I have two questions. Mm -hmm. First of all, how does it respond to sweat or tears or to change in conductivity of the skin? Mm -hmm. And the second question is where this picture was taken. This one? Yes. So this was our group retreat. Um, it was somewhere in Tel Aviv. Uh, Sarah, he, he, she's my uh, administrator, so check with her. I don't remember. Um, uh, we were doing uh, cooking. It's, it was a, one of our group retreats from a few years ago, so uh, it was uh, cooking um, Thai food. It was really, really brilliant. Uh, first question, sweat. So um, under normal sweating conditions, like what we're experiencing right now, actually sweat is a good thing because it's conducting, so there's, there's no problem. Um, Severe sweating conditions, like what you expect to see when people are doing sports or when people are in, uh, in a, uh, going through surgery. This is something we haven't tested systematically. We gave these electrodes um, to um, uh, one guy who um, went jogging with them and um, said it was perfectly, uh, perfectly fine, but we didn't systematically. Actually, we're beginning a couple of projects that would require uh, stability. There are quite a lot of um, 
commercial materials out there that you can use. I mean, we're using everything we use for this particular project is off-the-shelf material. So we're actually using uh, 3M products that, you know, and they have huge variety of different uh, films that were designed for all sorts of applications. So um, the technology is there. It shouldn't be a problem. Right. I mean, you. No. The, the 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 you basically you're recording the uh, the the sort of manifestation of the action potential. So you're not really um, you're measuring. It, it, it doesn't affect the uh, the G, uh, GSR is 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 an additional property that you can measure, and then you're actually directly uh, looking at sweating. So chemical sensing. Uh, is a much, much, much bigger field. I mean, when most people working in, in the field of wearable sensors actually look at, at sweat and trying to do chemical analysis of sweat. Uh, and this is a big thing uh, in, in, in sports. Um, but um, sweat is actually a feature. It's not a, it's not a bug in, in this particular case. Okay. So let's thank uh, Yael and the rest.